we want to talk about um, um, persistent identifiers and the role they play in, um, do I call it building open research infrastructure? But this is just an introductory webinar because um, we are hoping that we can still dig more into this on a later date or dates. Uh, and um, we have um, Paul and Helena from DataSight and uh, Banda from Ubuntu Net and then Bosu from IITA. So I want us to start, but I do not know if we could, um, all right, I think that we have an appreciable number here. And I am Ukem Osigwe, I work for AFLIA, African Library and Information Institutions and Associations with headquarters in Accra, Ghana. We, um, the organization is a, a platform for the African library sector, you know, to give us a common voice, to, to give us, um, yeah, a voice for the whole um, African library sector. and. We are working with data site. Actually, data site is the instigator of this. Let me not take the glory for Afia. Data site came up with this idea, and we hope that you all will listen, you all will learn, and you all will understand why we need um, persistent identifiers for our research output, not just for your personal one, but for your institutions, so that your, your, your research will be more visible discoverable and um, easier to use. Thank you very much. So I now call on Paul of um, data site. Hello, Paul, are you ready for us? Yes, and Kim, thanks a lot. Um, I'm now Hello, Paul, uh, starting. Are you ready for us? can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you loud oh, and clear. You can hear Let's me already? Right. Cool. Thanks. So I'm uh, starting yeah. to share my screen. Thanks a lot. Um, and as attendees still are coming in, um, I want to thank all of you to um, for for joining this webinar. Uh, this is, as Nkem said, an introductory webinar um, to um, give you an introduction to, to PIDs in general, but also DOIs in particular, and and how our data site works and how working with data site is. So. Let's start with um, PIDs. So as I said, uh, I give an introduction to what persistent identifiers are, how they're used and what, what uh, PIDs, how PIDs are used in scholarly communication. So um, what are persistent identifiers? Persistent identifiers are especially URLs that are registered in the yeah. system, like DOI, ORCID, or ROAR. Um, you can see one here right at the top, that is uh, DOI that uh, is used by the re data repository Dryad. Um, and this resolves to, um, to a resource, resource uh, and, uh, uh, or the metadata representation, the landing page. And the, the persistent identifi identifier is uh, defined by Coster as unique universal persistent identifier actually. And uh, identifier means that it's a string of digits referring to an object, as you can see, here at the top, I will refer to that syntax later. And it's also unique. So that's, this is really the only one that is um, there and uh, referring to one object only uh, and in, in the so-called universe. So universal means that within the realm of, of the World Wide Web, the internet, this is, this is the, um, the um, space which in, in which the, the identifier um, results. Persistent means that it is um, independent of individual, individual institutions or systems or implementations of them, and um, can will always re, um, refer to to the resource that uh, the URL is given. So um, these objects are um, most of the times on, online accessible objects, so digital objects, and um, these these PIDs are most often. Actionable. That's it. it. Means that are, they are resolvable with a um, resolver standing in, uh, at the at the beginning of, of the uh, persistent identifier. So um, there are persistent identifiers for many things, um, as you can see, like there for for organizations, people, and things. 
Um, I'll list here the three major open um, persistent identifiers. There is uh, the so-called open research and contributor ID ORCID um, that identifies researchers um, um, because there, there is this issue of um, disambiguation within um, um, yeah, research of, of researchers. Um, there, the same goes for institutions because there might be institutions that have similar names or the attribution or affiliation is not really, uh, is really an issue because um, people might not know to whom they, uh, um, yeah, this, this, uh, with which institution this um, publication is linked to or affiliated with. And last but not least, the DUI um, that refers to, refers to things um, such as research outputs. Um, um, apart from DOIs, there are also handles, um, IGs, and other um, persistent identifiers referring to um, research outputs. And how do they actually work? Um, they um, they are created within institutional administered systems like repositories, for instance, but also publishers to use them. Um, and this is a, a purely a matter of service. So they provide a service to, to researchers that, um, that are using, um, using that service. And the, the institution takes care of, of resolving these, uh, these identifiers to the, to the resource, so to the landing page or to the document. Um, and this magic doesn't emerge from the strings themselves, but as I said, from these uh, open scholarly uh, infrastructures, such as data side, we provide the service to these institutions uh, and um, the institutions add their meta metadata to that. And we provide this uh, metadata via services um, uh, like APIs that you can use um, um, from data side. And the a PID string is always built according to a consistent schema um, or syntax. As you can see there down here, you have um, the domain which is in our case the doi.org you have the prefix um, that um, belongs to the to the repository or the publisher um, or to the journal depending on, on uh, what kind of publication place this is and the suffix that um, describes the research uh, uniquely so how are pids used um, first of all they link like this is may, may sound trivial but they are used to to link to publications persistently. So if you have the problem, um, like many websites do have, that they're not persistent, that like existed 20 years ago, these links may rot and they give you a 404 error and are not accessible any longer. This is, this is what uh, persistent identifiers and DOIs seek to avoid and to have a persistent, um, persistent um, linkage to these resources. And PIDs also disambiguate, as I said. They disambiguate people. Um, with the ORCID IE, for instance, um, you have uh, people throughout their lives changing their names, for instance. Um, but also you have, as I said, um, people with the same name. And you really need to know who's the one that I can, uh, I need to um, um, address or um, yeah, refer to it when it comes to citations, for instance. But also they do disambiguate organizations. Uh, here's an example of a German research center that has these at least 12 name variations that um, could be found on the internet. On the left, you can see the raw identifier that refers to that very institution so that everybody is aware using that uh, ID that this is uh, the re research institution that uh, is meant with that name. And also PIDs make data fair. They make it fair because um, um, they make it findable, for instance, because the metadata that is assigned to um, persistent identifiers um, should be rich and should also uh, describe the, 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 um, the object clearly and explicitly. And it's registered in, in our services and, and databases that also Helena will later refer to. Uh, such as data set comments. It's accessible um, through standardized communication protocols that we do use as uh, a data site. Um, and also, um, yeah, the metadata is acceptable when it's not, when the data is not longer available. 
uh, it's interoperable because um, the, the metadata that we have, we have a metadata schema, the data, data set metadata schema in version 4.4 currently uh, is, um, is um, very, um, very comprehensive and is able to describe the resource in a very, very detailed manner. And it's reusable because the metadata schema is uh, open. It can be used by every institution um, to provide metadata on a, um, usage li uh, with a usage license, for instance, on the provenance and, and other um, standards, community standards. Um, so as I said, these, these PIDs make the data fair, um, which is very important. And coming to the last point, PIDs and scholarly communication, um, I wanted to show you this rather complex um, research, um, PID optimized research life cycle. Um, this represents the research life cycle, um, uh, a visualization um, created by more brains. And it shows you how and which steps of the research life cycle, what kind of actors or stakeholders are involved, like funding agencies, research performing organizations, researchers themselves, but also research output platforms. Um, and what kind of persistent identifier um, providers such as Coursera, DataSight, Orchid, and uh, Raw and all the others are involved. And as you can see all around the cycle, there's always a DOI involved, starting with the, um, with the grant application and review that happens with funders um, that um, then goes on to the grant award and the um, project res registration if the proposal was accepted. And you have then the open sub submission where the DOI and ORCID ID and ID go together. And also uh, at the end in the output pub publication and the registration in in a uh, um, using the, the data side metadata schema, for instance, um, to make it available to to the to the outer world, and then it goes back to reporting, having all these um, these publications linked with persistent identifiers, um, so that based on these reportings, um, these the funders are do know what the research output or what the impact was that um, their funding made. So really PIDs, as can be seen on this, uh, in this visualization, PIDs are at the center of scholarly communication and really help citing um, research outputs um, persistently and do not really create um, the, the, the disadvantage of, of linked rod. And what I, what I said is, um, why are they fantastic? As I said there, they prevent link what um, so that links break. This is really crucial um, to persistent identifiers being in the name of persistent, obviously. Very unique uh, because it refers, um, there's just, just this one persistent identifier for one um, publication or data set or person. And they, are, they allow unambiguous citation, as I said, and they can be linked to other PIDs. As you've just seen in in the cycle, they really um, create a, a value to researchers and organizations and funders and publishers if they are all linked together. If we know that this very person created this publication with this grant, um, then these all these PIDs make sense and are um, made available for us now, but also in the long term future. Um, and also, it's um, it is really crucial that um, um, PIDs can be used for comprehensive and correct assignment of research contribution, and then they show that um, the impact of uh, the scientific record of this very person or this institution. And last but not least, the use of, of PIDs is recommended by research funders and organizations. So. This is it from my side. I want to thank you and um, maybe hand over to Helena. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, if you can stop sharing your screen, I will share mine.
Okay, there we go. I hope you can see my, my screen okay. Um, yeah, I'm really excited that uh, we, we have this webinar today. It's a really great opportunity to provide this, this introduction to persistent identifiers as Paul did and also provide an introduction uh, to DataSite. Uh, please feel free afterwards to ask all questions that you may have. Uh, we're happy to talk about everything. Um, and with that, let me just jump in. I am Helena. I'm Data Sites Director of Community Engagement. Um, I think Paul already mentioned Data Site, but just start from the beginning. Data Site is a global nonprofit membership organization, and we work with over 2,000 repositories around the world. Yes, and that's provide uh, persistent identifiers, specifically DOIs uh, for data and also other research outputs that sit in repositories. And our vision is to connect research to identify knowledge through the assignment of persistent identifiers. And to clarify a bit what we mean by that, what we actually do, the building that you see on your screen is a research institution. And within research institutions, many different kinds of research outputs are being generated as part of the research. For example, data sets, also software, reports, protocols, can be many different things. And now if these just sit on a researcher's uh, computer or on an external hard drive, then at the end of the project, uh, they kind of disappear. And that's what you see happening on the left. All these research outputs are kind of fading out. They're not becoming part of the research ecosystem. Um, but that is why we recommend assigning a persistent identifier, because if you assign a persistent identifier, such as, for example, a DOI, um, research outputs can, can become connected to each other. So, for example, uh, an article can be connected to the data uh, or data can be connected to the software that was used to analyze it. And also through the metadata that is um, registered with the persistent identifier, um, the output becomes discoverable. So other researchers can, found, can find the research outputs that you created. Um, and with the persistent identifier, it becomes easier to track whether those researchers are then reusing um, the output, the data set, for example. And then the institution can track uh, where all the outputs are and whether they're being reused by other researchers. So um, the value that we try to provide and what we hear from our members is that most institutions join data site to make their outputs discoverable because they want their outputs to be in the world and they want other researchers to be able to use those outputs. And with a DOI, the output is uniquely identifiable. All the metadata is in a central location and can be harvested by search engines, for example. And it also makes it easy to follow best practices. Paul already mentioned fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable which is a very important goal nowadays. Um, it's, it's seen in many policies that data should be fair. And persistent identifiers play a key role in making data fair. They're part of all the, the four principles. Uh, and so assigning a DOI, which is really easy and can be done in less than a minute, helps with making your data and other outputs fair. And as I also said on the previous slide, it really helps with tracking research. Um, so uh, as an institution, but also as a researcher, you want to know where your outputs are and whether others can find those outputs, whether they're viewing the outputs, whether they're using the outputs. And that is much easier when you have a DOI. So um, I mentioned we're a membership organization. So how DataSite works is that uh, institutions can join DataSite as a member and then they can register DOIs for outputs in their repositories. Um, and so we have a probably by now a little more than 245 members, and these represent over a thousand institutions uh, because we have both direct members uh, that 
register DOIs for their own organizations. And we also have consortia uh, at the national or the regional level that provide DOI services to multiple organizations. And that's also why the number of organizations is higher than the number of members. And uh, yeah, later today in this webinar, you hear more about uh, the data, a relevant data site consortium uh, in Africa. Um, and we work with members in 48 countries around the world that have registered over 25 million DOIs at this point. Um, and yeah, there are many repositories in Africa that are already registering DOIs. I looked through our systems. I hope I found all the repositories and the different countries where data site DOIs are already being registered. And importantly, earlier this year, uh, I looked at the, the tweet and that was apparently in May, uh, the Ubuntu Net Alliance joined DataSight as a consortium lead. So they are now leading uh, a consortium for organizations in uh, Eastern and Southern Africa that want to register DataSight DOIs. And I'm really glad that they're here today to, to tell you more about that themselves. And so what you can then do as a member is you can create and manage DOIs. Um, and you can set up multiple repository accounts to do that. And we have three ways to enable you to create and manage DOIs. One is that we provide an API that you can integrate with uh, and to automate DOI registration. But I said earlier that you can uh, register a DOI in less than a minute. Uh, so if you don't want to start with a whole integration, we also have a manual interface. We just give you a username and password and you log into that interface, uh, you enter information about your data set or other output manually. Uh, so you enter all the metadata yourself, you click the button and you register a DOI. So it's easy to get started. And we also work with a number of service providers and these are platforms that provide DOI registration functionality. Um, so they uh, have already integrated with DataSite and when you use their platform, you only have to switch that integration on to, uh, to start registering DOIs. And I think Bosun later today will also give an example uh, of how uh, his organization is using a platform for DOI registration. And then um, one thing I wanted to mention that I think is really important and really a key part of registering DOIs is that you don't just get a persistent identifier, but you uh, submit all the metadata about the data set. And so we have a metadata schema developed by the community uh, with a range of mandatory, recommended and optional elements. So the mandatory elements you have to enter when you register a DOI. Uh, and then the more metadata, the better, because the more information you provide, the better discoverable the output becomes. Uh, and it also provides opportunity to make connections. Paul mentioned that as well. Uh, and in that context, I wanted to highlight the related identifier field uh, where you can say, this DOI for my data set is related to this article with this DOI. And that, for example, helps to um, service data citations. And so that is a really important part of DOI registration to ensure you enter all the metadata, all the information you have to really make the most of your persistent identifier. And uh, something we've been working on over the last couple of years in a European project is uh, what we call the PIT graph. And based on all this information in the metadata, we start linking different entities together so that we don't only know about the relationship between A and B and B and C. But based on this graph, we also know about the relationship between A and C. And that gives us a lot of new information and allows us to start asking new questions. And all this information um, is then serviced in what we call DataSite Commons. You can find it at commons.datasite.org. Uh, and you can see here, we're connecting datasets to publications, to software, to funders, to organizations, and to researchers to create that graph. And then we display that information at the level of the output, at the level of the people, and at the level of the organization. 
Uh, and so, for example, here you see an, uh, the researcher level. So you can look at an individual researcher within data site commons, and you can see uh, all their different works, information about their works, um, and also reuse of their works. Um, and I suppose in a way, the other way around, if you look at a specific output, you can see that all the people that contributed to it, which then support recognition for the work that they've done. And here, looking at a, at a data set in Dryad, uh, we're showing the information we have about reuse. So how often was it viewed? How often was it downloaded? And how often was it cited? Um, yeah, one last thing I wanted to say, uh, if you're very interested uh, in, in PITS uh, after this webinar today, or you were already very interested, then uh, please consider joining the PIT forum, uh, where uh, you can continue this and other discussions about persistent identifiers. Um, and yeah, I will stop there. Um, as I said, we're really happy to answer any questions you may have either during this webinar or afterwards. So please feel free to get in touch with us if there's anything you'd like to know or discuss. And yeah, I'm very excited to hear more from the next two speakers about how they are uh, working with DataSite. Thank you very much. I think it's my turn now, and I'll just go straight into it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, welcome. Uh -huh. OK, all right, thanks, Ken. Uh, <clears throat> let me set my video. Um, I'm Tiwonge Banda. I work with Ubuntu Net Alliance for Research and Education Network. We are based in Lilongwe in, in, in Malawi. I'm glad to see on the participants list some people that I know there. Uh, Okay, so maybe, so my presentation, as you see, is, is going to be about working with the data site consortium as the, as Paul and, and, and Helena already talked about Ubuntu Alliance having established or formed a consortium uh, or register or joining uh, data site in May as a consortium lead. So I'm going to talk about uh, us as a consortium working with data site. So, but before I get to that, let me talk about what we are and what we do so that we, we, we are all on the same page. So Ubuntu and Alliance is the regional research and education network for Eastern Southern Africa. We are both an association of national research and education networks and a provider of connectivity and other value added services to these national research and education networks. So these national research and education networks, for those that may not be aware about them, they are in, in loose terms defined as the specialized internet service providers dedicated to the needs of the research and education networks. Imagine an ISP in a country that just focuses on connectivity for and value added services to research and education institutions. That's what we do. So we operate at the regional level as, as a regional association of these national networks. Currently, there are 17 national research and education networks, as you can see on the map, the map on the right, on the, the reds are the members, but the region includes like 26 countries. So if you look at the blue and the reds, that's our membership region from Sudan all the way down to South Africa, including the island nations on the west of the Indian Ocean. So some are small, so some island nations are, are quite small. We could not, we are not able to show them here, but there is Mauritius, uh, the Seychelles, they are all, the Comoros, they are all in our membership region. Uh, but our secretariat is, is in Kampala, in, I mean, in Lilongwe in Malawi, but our network operation center is in Kampala in, 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 in Uganda. So this, this is the same thing, just showing the membership in terms of what we are. The mem as, as I said, that the members are the entrants. So those are the entrants. If you are coming from any of those countries, you can see the, the, the entrant member in, in, in your particular country. As I said, there are 17, and so uh, Botswren, Botswana is the newest. They actually joined at the beginning of the year, and we continue to work with the other blues to make them become members. Uh, so those are our objectives. We develop and provide high-speed and affordable interconnectivity among NRANs 
with the rest of the world. We, we do develop and share knowledge and skills in, of ICT practitioners as to very much about capacity building. And the main focus, which is related to this workshop, is ab about providing related auxiliary services to the NRINs and their communities. We also do participate and sometimes, sometimes lead uh, in research aimed at improving the network infrastructure. But today, the focus is on related auxiliary services. Um, just, just for you to, um, to appreciate the scope and the, the reach of our network, that's how our network, the map you see on the right, shows the extent of our, the extent of our network uh, covering all the different countries that, that I have spoke about. We are currently connecting 12 countries. So in a nutshell, our services are as primarily it's connectivity, but we also do provide Edgeroom, which is a global Wi-Fi roaming service. This is very much offered by the NRINs, but, but we do provide the regional infrastructure, which connects with those, the national infrastructure that the NRINs use. We also do provide trust and identity services. We have a managed HUID, we call it a managed identity provider service, we call it HUID. And then we also do have, we do offer digital certificates. We have an agreement with Sectigo that they give us SSL certificates. We do a lot of capacity building, and now we have included DOI, the same DOI services in our, in our portfolio. And we also, we're also waiting on providing cloud services. This will start sometime next, next year. Enough with that. Now to the business of today. Uh, so Ubuntu Net Alliance, as already mentioned, we joined DataSight as a consortium lead uh, on 19th of May, 2021. Maybe I should also mention that we support open science. We, as Ubuntu Alliance, have been participating or promoting open science since our early days. We have participated in a number of EU-funded projects where, like EI for Africa, SciGaia, some of you may be familiar with these projects that we run in the past, and we have, we have run workshops around the continent uh, delivering, I mean, advocating for open science. And currently, under the Africa Connect project, we are in the, we are from, we are we we have a joint program called LibSense, which Wakrin is leading, and some of you, I'm sure, you do participate in the work in in the LibSense activities. Uh, so having joined, having established this consortium and, and uh, as a consortium lead in 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 data site, our membership now is open to all research and education institutions in Eastern and Southern Africa. So our scope is only Eastern and Southern Africa because of the agreements that we have with Wakrin and ASRIN. So we only focus on Eastern and Southern Africa. Wakrin focuses on Western and Central Africa and ASRIN focuses on North Africa. But for us, in this case, we are only taking members from Eastern and Southern Africa. And now DOI registration is part, as I mentioned, of our portfolio of services. At the moment, we have two member organizations in our consortium. Uh, the, the, the first one is us as Ubuntu Alliance because we were taking DOIs from CRUID before we established our own uh, consortium. And we also do have NADRE from, from Ethiopia, which was, has, has joined the consortium. And as I say, membership is open. Please join us and then we become part of the data site community. At the moment, we have like 18,900 DOIs uh, registered. Now, if you want to join the, data, the Ubuntu Net data site consortium, uh, just send an email to devops at ubuntunet.net expressing your interest and we'll get in touch with you. Um, we probably will put a form to simplify this process because we will need some basic information about the organization, the contact persons and, the, and your needs for, 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 for DOI registration. We, when you do that, we create accounts for you on the data site Fabrica for, for your organization to register and manage DOIs as well as associated metadata. Uh, and then we will run a, an onboarding process for you to get to understand the process of registering and managing DOIs. We, we find that that process is quite, quite important as we, we did that when we established the consortium data site took us through that process and we think it's something that we will be doing for all our members that are joining. And I must mention that capacity building is available in coordination with data sites. Like this workshop today is part of this capacity building. Now, 
just, just a bit about our benefits of joining our consortium, your organization becomes part of the growing list of data side members globally, as you saw the number of members globally that Helena showed and, and all the, um, uh, the repositories that are there. So by joining, you become part of this. And that by part of this, you are supporting open science by making your data and research output locatable, identifiable, and citable. That's the whole idea. Um, it's easy to create DOIs and register metadata using the data site Fabrica, which uh, Helena talked a little bit about that. And for me, I find that there is a test environment. I find this very important and very useful because you can test and learn things, make mistakes before registering your DOIs uh, in, in, in the production data site Fabrica. So I find this test environment quite useful. So in a nutshell, that's all I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Banda. Um, Bosu, are you ready? Hello, Bosu, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Please do remember to, yeah. Thank you very much, Bosu, please. You have the floor, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. I'm Bosno Bileye. The full name is Olat Bosno Bileye, the Institutional Data Manager at IITA. On this subject, making your research visible and creating more impact using data site, I'll be giving you our experience at IITA. Who is IITA? This is not a question, but I just want to explain. IIT stands for International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. It was established in 1967 with the HQ, the headquarters in Ibadan, Nigeria. Currently, IIT has 21 stations with presence in 30 countries. And this can be seen from the map that we have here. All this color shows what we call OBS. The green represents the West African hub. The yellow represents the Eastern African hub. The, I should like call it light like or purple now, represents the Central African hub. And uh, uh, this is not green, but uh, you know what I'm talking about. That's the region, the lower part of Africa represented Southern African hub, where we have presence. IIT is part of the one CGIAR, which comprises of several other research centers spread across the globe. In 2017, IIT, we adopted Dataside DOI through British Library Consortium. What's our dream at IIT? IIT wish to have an institutional data repository that conforms to open access and open data. You also wish to ensure that the repository is acceptable and integrable to the future CGIAR global data platform. The repository should be trusted with long-term access. It must be accessible globally without any restriction. The repository must meet fear. Fear means findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable as a data repository and should conform to CGIAR agreed metadata standard. We have standard within CGIAR and how it is just like a center before, now we are fully part of the one CG. While we are setting this platform up, the dream is that in the future, CGIAR may become one. And whatever we have at IITA, we don't want it to become dumpster. It should be valuable and we should be able to link them up with bigger repositories. And that's why we went ahead and we blew a repository platform with a, I mean, with a system called SIC and Comprehensive Knowledge Archiving Network. And we adopted Dataside UHI as a permanent identifier. Why did we do that at IIT? Because 
data size supports data citations with some APIs. API is application programming interface that allow us to expose data with citations and can be visible for people to see, to download, to read. Data site increase data visibility with third party partnerships and integrations. You'll be surprised that when you Google for put IITA and maybe put maze, you'll be surprised to see the data from scientists being shown even on Google or many search engines. Data use tracker. As you use our data, we can track it using the tools that they have provided. And there's availability of citation formatter, which allow us to present data citation within our repository platform. If you visit citation.crossprep.org, that tool is there. But our own platform is data.iita.org, where you can view your data. You can make citation when you're using such a data. It has a supportive community. Uh, I need to comment about that. When you throw in the question, you'll be, you'll be bombarded with support from different parts of the globe, from North America, Southern America, Europe, up to Australia. You will see response. So it's a, it's a fantastic community and it's easy to manage. So how do this work? IIT adopts two methods of the DOI minting. Assignment of DOI is called minting. So there is the automated and the manual. Both are present within the DOI platform provided by data site. So we use the auto generation of DOI for some platform that we integrated using a programming language we call it Python and we use data site API. Then the manual is to another platform within data site that's called Fabrica. So for instance, we have research database that is hosted by Cornell, it's called Cassava Base. IIT has thousands of data that belongs to IIT within this research database. And we want this data to be available. At the same time, we want to assign permanent identifier to them. Cassava is required to authenticate, but SICAN does not require authentication. And when you're talking about fear, findable, accessible, interpretable, reusable, there's something that is called fear and there's something that's called open. Absolute openness means that there is no technological restriction. So we want to remove the technological barrier. That is, you just go to the data and click on it, opens. You don't need to authenticate. So to do that, we needed to integrate with our SICAN. SICAN is already, I mean, integrated with data side DOI. So once you come to our SICAN, we have integrated a backdoor, some mechanism that we built at the back end. You just click on the data and data from cassava base voila shows with the DOI minted from data site. So that's where we use them. And you can submit your data to us through email, through data submission platform that you built and sometimes to share drive. So this is just a diagrammatic expression of what I explained now. This is for the auto generation and the manual. When you are auto generating it, the data site DOI is exposed to our second. And in between it, we have the YAM, I mean the cassava base. So for those that to be automated, we route it through our scripting for the manual. We go through the, the process where we receive it manually, screen it manually, then we assign the DOI manually. And for the automated, this is just the process. We have the cassava base for some instance. We still have other more databases. And second is our platform. We use BRAP. Then at the back end, we have what is called JSON, which integrates with data site and then auto generates the API. And one good thing is that we use CG core metadata within CGIAR. Data site has its own data site metadata. But it's so flexible in such a way that you, I don't need to type in our data metadata into data site CG core MC and data site platform for the DOI. It sees the CG core metadata that we already have in our repository, pull it by itself, and it automatically sets it up for the I mean data citation. So it's a fantastic platform. The backend work has been done. They have fantastic programmer doing that. So this is how it works. 
is we use our CG conversion tool. It merges with data set metadata and then the minted DOI. So this is transmitted to cross site. Cross site is used for generating references. Then the output style is posted to Sikan for us to be able to generate our citation. So all these three, they came together and the output is multi-style data citation. And you can do whatever you have with the data you are citing there. Data site DOI, we are doing more with it, with the more friends. It facilitated the setting up of multi-style data citation, integration with customized metadata for CGIR. It integrates seamlessly. We set up plans for multi-repository DOI infrastructure, and we are currently implementing that. The site databases with that DOI data citation and CG metadata that were integrated into SICAN. So we have done cassava base, the Mosa base, and Jam base. We are near completion. The same thing with our maze. And one of the, the data manager for that maze, I mean the lead data manager for maze is actually on this platform. I could see him watching this program also. So we do more. I mentioned about the data citation. And so if you land on our data.iita.org, for instance, this is a data that is meant for consumer consumption, consumer preference, blah, blah, blah. You will see the option of any citation style you wish to pick, whether it's APA, Harvard, whatever it is, you see it, and then you can select the one that you want. The metadata is there, and then you download the data. We encourage you to cite our data when you use it. We have more impact and better acceptance from researchers and it is as a result of their PID being exposed. We have increased research data visibility within and outside the CGIAR. The CGIAR has a big data platform called Guardian and our data at ITA is massively exposed with the DOI. We comply with fair data principle using that data site DOI, it improves our partnership because our data are trusted and it enhances data management practices in the institution. And finally, it attracts more funding because our repository is seen as a trusted repository. Funders know that when they have their data that's generated with the fund that they provide to us, the data is going to be persistently available. Thank you. <laughs>